Hello my friends and welcome once again to this Writing Game in Tech video with myself, Amata. I hope you guys are keeping well and for those of you in the UK alongside myself, I hope you guys are doing okay so far in the early days of this second lockdown. I am here as always with the latest news from the tech and gaming world from the last 24 or so hours as of the 6th of November. We are going to be beginning things with some interesting comments from AMD's Robert Halleck about Ryzen 5000. So, as I said, we have finally had the release of Zen 3 just yesterday, but there's some questions that were still floating around and AMD's Robert Hannock decided to answer them, give some further clarification, and these will helpfully gather into one single post by videocards.com, so we will include a link to their article uh, in the description below. So, he said, and I'm just going to go down the list in order, Ryzen 5000 doesn't need a power plan, don't expect to see one. Yes, it can clock to DDR4, 4001 to 1 if you have a good sample. And there's an upcoming Igisa update that will make this a bit easier for you. You can tweak Ryzen performance versus power with the Win 10 Power and Sleep Cider after the chipset driver is installed. The memory controller is indeed the same. And then I'm just going to skip over a few questions that I'm not really wanting to focus on here because I want to focus on the very last one here. But of course, the article is there if you want to read the rest of the stuff that he spoke about. He spoke about undervolting and he said it's gone, joking. Temporarily gone for 5000 series. It'll be back in an upcoming Agisa with new functionality. It's going to be hype. You ain't never seen undervolting quite like this. And someone said, can you tell me more? And sadly, the answer was no. So basically... The highlight from that is the fact that undervolting is going to be a thing for Ryzen 5000 and apparently we're going to be seeing some interesting functionality to improve this with an upcoming Agisa update. What that is, is anyone's guess, but we will obviously get more details as time progresses. I just wanted to highlight that it will indeed be coming. We're going to move on to some less great news though for Zen 3 up next. Now, I'm sure I'm not telling you guys something you don't already know, but I'd be remiss if I didn't highlight this at least a little. Uh, with the launch of the Ryzen 5000 series, getting hold of one now is pretty damn annoying, to say the least. Now, AMD did, of course, at least according to the leaked document last month, sent a list of instructions to retailers to basically try and cut down on the amount of scalpers and bots and all that sort of stuff. You know, purchase limits, captures, all that sensible stuff, but sadly, it has done pretty much nothing to stop the availability issues that we have seen with the other big tech products that have released so far this year. All of the big places are sold out and if you want one, well, be prepared to pay a way higher price than you should on eBay and I would not recommend paying the prices that these processes are going for because some of them are insane. Just to give you a quick example, I have just done a very quick search for the Ryzen 5900X. As you can see, the top result is 17... £780, excuse me. £600 is the one below that. Then we've got some pre vet PCs. I'm just going to skip over that. But then we've got £784, £721, uh, 766 819 You know, it's it's just insane. Just just wait. Obviously, I don't think anyone's going to rush out and pay that sort of price because that's crazy. But I just wanted to uh, highlight this. That sadly, despite the alleged efforts, according to that leaked document, we have seen uh, Zen 3 suffer from the same availability issues. And speaking of which, let's move on to RX 6800 XT. Now obviously it is a little while, a couple of weeks roughly, until we see the release of the RX 6800 XT, but an Asus Nordic representative has taken to the Sui Clockers forums, and this is the Asus Nordic brand rep David Hammer, amazing surname by the way, and he has said that the 6800 XT is expected to set up within minutes after launch, and is basically warned of a low 6800 XT stock uh, for launch day. But let me not put words in his mouth long, I'm just going to read a direct quote here. He said, quote, It will be quite limited, more 6800, fewer 6800 XT. As with basically all graphics cards now, we expect that everything will be gone within a few minutes, so you need to hang on the lock. Then it is one to two weeks later until we start delivering our partner's cards. Too early to say what the supply looks like there, but the demand will probably continue to be great. So hopefully, you know, maybe AMD somehow manages to think of some solution to stop the same repeat of what happened with the RTX 30 series and of course with Zen 3 from happening again with the RX 6800 XT and of course the rest of the RX 6000 cards that we know about so far. 
But if these predictions are true, we are going to be seeing the same story play out again. 6800 XT, uh, you know, the Founders Edition, selling out within minutes and then not a couple of weeks until we get the AOBs. And obviously there being AOB cards is going to help. But because, you know, let's, let's just say that the prediction is correct and the 6800 XT goes out of stock within 10 minutes or whatever. Obviously everyone's going to be there waiting for the release of the MSI ASUS whoever, doesn't matter, uh, graphics cards, I'm going to be buying them because they couldn't get one from AMD. So it's going to be a repeat of the same thing just with AIB cards, unless of course they have the stock to actually match the demand. Yeah, I mean hopefully it is a better situation, but with how Zen 3 has gone, I'm not particularly hopeful to be honest. But, you know, it's better to be pleasantly surprised and disappointed, but that's my arguably very cynical opinion. <laughs> Anyway, let's move on to Intel, some rumours regarding Alder Lake. Now, I will say before I get into the particulars of this topic that this is all credit to Moore's Law is Dead. You can, of course, find his video linked in the description below. Anyway, so according to his information, Intel has at least three lineups planned for launch after we see Rocket Lake come out. First of which is, of course, Alder Lake. Then we're going to see Meteor Lake, and then we're going to see Lunar Lake. Thankfully, that isn't all the information Moore's Law actually had. Uh, we do have some estimates of the improvements, specs, that sort of thing that we can expect uh, for Older Lake. So, we're going to be seeing this allegedly, do you remember, pinch of salt TM, salt shaker is definitely required for this. By 2022, Older Lake based on Golden Cove IPC, uh, roughly 10 to 20% over Tiger Lake. That's been going around for quite some time now. That's not really anything new. Um, and of course, we're going to be seeing a clock speed improvement over Tiger Lake. And we're going to be seeing 32 EU Gen 12 graphics. Now, obviously, as we know now officially, thanks to Intel confirming it some time ago now, Intel's Older Lake is, of course, a big small layout. And we're going to be seeing... 8 plus 8, 8 plus 4, and then 6 plus 4 for the skews and the die layout, and another die is allegedly going to be 6 plus 0, and as Moore's Law rightly points out, that is most likely going to be for i3s. Oh, and of course, we are going to be seeing 8 core 16 threads plus 8 core grace mont for the top die. Now, one other thing I want to mention from this first set of informations is that the LGA 1700 platform is apparently going to be multi-generation with both Meteor Lake and Lunar Lake as potentially working on this platform and apparently we're going to be seeing support for Old Lake for both DDR4 and DDR5. Unsurprisingly given that Lunar Lake is still very very early we literally don't even know when we're going to be seeing it where he's given roughly year estimates for the other information we literally just have a set of question marks here so there's not really much to say about it. It wouldn't really be right to speculate about it now. It's obviously very, very early uh, for Lunar Lake. Anyway, Moore's Law did have quite a bit more to discuss, but obviously I don't want to go over all of his information because that wouldn't be fair to him. Again, you will find the link at the top of the list um, for the links. You'll see what I mean when you look at the description. I always clearly mark where the links are in his video. will be at the top, so go give it a watch if you want to know more and the other information that I haven't shared in this particular video as well. Before we move on to a couple of gaming pieces of news, however, I'm going to finish up our tech segment with the RTX 3060 Ti. So this one is thanks to videocards.com. They have shared with us, and of course the internet, uh, the very first renders of the RTX 3060 Ti Gaming OC Pro from Gigabyte. Now, a couple of days ago, they did share some other renders of the 3060 Ti, uh, this time the Eagle, and it is a dual fan design, but this particular Gigabyte one is a triple fan design for the 3060 Ti. So we're going to be seeing 8-pin and 6-pin power connectors um, on the OC Pro. And in terms of specifications, we are going to be seeing 4864 CUDA cores, 8 gigs of GDDR6 memory, clocked at 14 GBPS with a memory bus of 256-bit. Sadly, we don't actually know concretely the boost clock, but it is rumoured to be roughly 665 MHz, and that would mean 16.2 T-flops of single precision compute power. 
And speaking of NVIDIA, I actually have a very interesting update to something we discussed just the other day. Now, you may recall that AMD recently clarified what we're going to be seeing for support for ray tracing, what games we're going to be seeing supported and stuff like that for the RX 6000 series. Go check out if you so desire. And just to remind you of the quote, if you've forgotten, AMD said via Adored TV, quote, AMD will support all ray tracing titles using industry-based standards, including the Microsoft DXR API and the upcoming Vulkan ray tracing API. Games making use of proprietary ray tracing APIs and extensions will not be supported. Now, basically, WCCF Tech took to... Brian Burke, the NVIDIA PR of gaming technology, esports, and consumer VR for clarification on the situation because, well, they just wanted to know, is this actually the case, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so they asked what games out there, ray tracing games out there, are using NVIDIA's proprietary technology. And Brian said, quote, the vast majority of games released with ray tracing support use the industry standard Microsoft DXR API. Three exceptions we are aware of include Quake 2, RTX, Wolfenstein, Youngblood, and GX3, which use NVIDIA ray tracing extensions for Vulkan. And the whole interview is very lengthy. I'm not going to touch on most of it because it's not really relevant for this topic, but it will be linked below, of course, for your reading pleasure. And WCCF Tank asked Brian, quote, Is NVIDIA putting up any roadblocks, either through publishers or the Kronos group, that will prevent AMD from adding ray tracing support to Quake 2, Wolfenstein Youngblood, and JX3 if they choose to? And Brian said something very interesting. He said, quote, Absolutely not. We've been contributing to the growth of the RT ecosystem for years and welcome other IHVs to add support. And then... WC further asked, will DXR games work on AMD GPUs? And he said, quote, DirectX Ray Tracing is an API defined from Microsoft for any hardware vendor to implement. The games built using DXR should work on any DXR compatible GPU. NVIDIA cannot speak to other IHVs, excuse me, supports plans for DXR. So essentially what NVIDIA are saying here is that AMD GPUs can support those games. However, they need to just put in some extra work, a little bit of extra elbow grease to get those games working correctly on our X6000 GPUs with ray tracing. So perhaps that's why AMD said that they won't be supported because obviously if you've got to say that it's officially supported and perhaps there's issues, perhaps if the drivers are at launch or you know, they're not 100% confident or something like that, I'm, I'm just guessing obviously, but regardless of that fact, um, it is not a hard line of no, they will not work on AMD GPUs, it's just they will require some extra elbow grease to get working correctly. Anyway, let's move on to some gaming news, the first of which is regarding Bloodborne on the PS5. So I will say this all comes to us thanks to Lance McDonald. And if you are a fan of FromSoft and Bloodborne in particular, you should know that name as he is the person who got the 60fps mod working on a modded PS4 Pro. Anyway, so he spoke on Twitter and he had some unfortunate news to share about how Bloodborne works on PS5. Many people, including myself, were hoping that we would see a increase to 60fps, um, but sadly that seems to not be the case, at least at the moment. He said, quote, OK, embargo is up and allowed to talk about PlayStation 5 backwards compatibility now. All I have to say is Sekiro is 60 FPS, Dark Souls 3 is 60 FPS, it's locked at 30 on Xbox Series X, and Bloodborne is still 30 FPS uh, with bad frame pacing. I am so goddamn happy with how fantastic the PS4 backwards compatibility is on PlayStation 5. Yeah, we're all sad Bloodborne didn't get some secret runtime patches beneath the hood to uncap the frame rate, but it still hits 30 FPS where the PS4 Pro was dropping frames before. So basically, the up the only upside to this is that it is more solid 30 FPS. Because as I'm sure, as you guys know, for anyone who's put any serious time into Bloodborne, the issue isn't just that it runs at 30, it's that sometimes it cannot even maintain 30, and it just feels very... You can feel the chug sometimes in, in busier areas. And at least a smooth 30 is better, but obviously 60 FPS would have been amazing. But perhaps they're saving this for an inevitable Bloodborne remaster. We'll have to wait and see, of course, but for now, at least on the backwards compatible version of Bloodborne, we will not be seeing 60 FPS. And sadly, I'm going to end on a bit of a down note, especially for fans of the medium. The game has been, you guessed it, delayed until next year. It was initially due out in just over a month's time on December the 10th, but it has been pushed back to January the 28th, 2021. 
and this is an official delay from Bloober Team, not a rumour or anything like that, and they officially said, quote, after much careful thought and consideration, today we have made the difficult decision to delay the launch of the medium to January 28th, 2021. It wasn't an easy choice to make, but one made due to the uh, current situation in Poland, as well as the current schedule of other games on the market, Bloober Team remains committed to delivering our biggest, most ambitious, fear-inducing experience to date. The additional development time will also add further polish, ensuring we deliver our innovative, genre-pushing pushing vision of interactive psychological horror. Now, obviously, the current conditions in the world with everything going on, don't you say what it is, didn't help. But the mention of other games in the market does make me think that this is probably something to do with the Cyberpunk 2077 release date delay. Because I'm sure they're well aware that that game is just going to suck everyone's time up for quite some time, given the amount of insane hype surrounding that game. Regardless of their reasoning behind it, though, I am still disappointed to see it delayed, but it's not a huge delay, I suppose. It's just over a month. I mean, there's so many games coming out at the end of this year. It's nice to have a bit of breathing room, to be honest, but it would have been nice to also get this on time because it looks really, really good. Disappointed, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's not that big of a deal. Anyway, that's me done. Have a good weekend, guys. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.